took LNG down, but then lost late game team fights. So as we're in the draft, the big question for me was what is C9 gonna do on red side? We were thinking Caitlyn, Callista, and Oriana bands, but we're gonna see what happens. Yeah, this is a big moment. You come into a game, it's a best of one. You gotta have the best draft possible prepared in this very contentious matchup. Ooh. There's the Renata. We've been talking a little bit about how that has been climbing in priority, and they're just gonna take it away from Caria altogether. Yeah, so this generally means Callista or Oriana are gonna be going through, which is not something that C9 has let through, and Oriana is something that Faker has played both games. Yeah, that, this is a really big question, right? If you feel like you can conquer Faker's Oriana, Chovy could do it. They'll ban the Azir. This is a pick that Faker has often been reliant on. We'll see if T1 will actually take the Kalista first here and break tradition from what we've seen from them so far, or if it is going to be the Oriana. They'll actually go to Guma Zaya. Now, this pick has such an insane win rate yeah. at this tournament, and it has been the best teams that are prioritizing it the highest, and it's one of Guma's best as well. Yeah, it, Zaya itself is 11-2 and two at the World Championship. It's the most wins that any champion has won in the main stage thus far. And it was also Guma's most played in summer. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to touch on that. Guma is so strong on this pick. I'm glad that at least they take the Rakan away because we saw a little bit of Zaya Rakan getting through yesterday. Weren't too happy about that on our side. But uh, C9 is going to take that one away. They also take away Faker's Oriana, which is the only thing he has played so far. But I do have to say that first pick, Zaya, still very valuable here for the side of T1. Now, Faker has gone back to Nico a lot in these types of scenarios where his priority pick is gone, the Azir is taken away. And I think he might actually save counter pick Ooh. for the later part of this, but it will be the Rumble they pick up here for Zayas first. So already two top tier picks going over the side of T1. We'll see if they want to grab an Alistair here as well. Doesn't show a whole lot. It's a top tier support pick, one that Caria is very good at. And I think that if you want to hide Faker's pick for now and see if C9 are interested in going deeper down that rabbit hole, the Alistair's one of the safest picks you could grab here right now. Yeah, it looks like they're actually going to keep support and mid to basically pinch C9's ability to ban out a specific role. But kind of just straight up power picks for T1 so far. Jarvan Rumble synergy is going to be really high. Rumble's a champion that hasn't made it through all that much. It's been banned 12 times so far in the main stage, the fourth most banned of all champions. But I mean, there's a chance we just go through this entire draft zero Callista. So even though it was the most banned champion thus far, it'll go unpicked unbanned this draft. Yeah. Now, Zeri going to come through here for Berserker as the 80 carry pick. So Zeri Rakan, very strong in the late game. You have so much setup for the Zeri. And even though you don't have a front line in this draft just yet, there's a lot of strong picks you can utilize, like Cassante, that will give you that front line. We'll see if T1 want to take that away. You also have a pseudo front line and that Rakan can hold choke points. You have Orianna to hold choke points. You can buy a lot of space for Zeri in a composition like this. Let's see if T1 want to keep the focus on that Cassante. The answer is yes. Asante has been all over the rift, as we have seen so far at uh, the world stage. The Nautilus against the Zeri taken off the board here. What is going to be this last ban for the side of C9? Could just be the Alistair, you know, I was talking yeah. about a lot here. It just seems like a really safe choice. You can pinch that support pool because Faker is a bit of an unknown here in this draft, but you know what the top tier support picks are for sure. And right. it's a no brainer here. I think especially since Berserker will be so critical to any C9 win. Just trying to make the T1 bottom lane as weak as possible via support bans is actually more important than trying to throw random bans at Faker. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting that T1 left, you know, Caria and potentially Faker here as the last picks because these are the two guys that have the biggest champion oceans on the side yeah. of T1. So I think it gives you a lot of flexibility to just say, let's see what C9 are going to pick, and then we can decide what we want to do next. I do wonder if Faker wants to play Nico to try to set up for Rumble and Jarvan combos here because it's left available, or if he'd rather go for something like a LeBlanc here. Strangely enough, it's not as popular these days, but it's a pick he's very well known for and one that would allow him to side lane pretty efficiently, put some pressure on the Oriana later on, come in at side angles to threaten Zeri. It's definitely a pick that I think is pretty niche, but one he could pull out here. Uh, it's gonna be Barry for Caria. <laughs> well, what do we have here? Wow. Caria pulling out the first bard of the tournament, and the Silas gonna be taken here as well. Definitely some decent ultimates on the opposite side. We've been seeing yeah. Jovi pick this up as well. The Silas pretty interesting, I'd say. Honestly, I've definitely seen better Silas ultimates. Nothing here screams to me, great yeah. Silas pick. There's no Maokai or Alistair on the other side that would be super powerful. It's more of that Faker just wants this for the general theme of their team composition. 
And then the Velveth coming in for Blabber as well. That's a, it's actually a departure from what Blabber's played for most of the Summer Split. Summer Split was a lot of Maokai Sejuani duty. So a totally different look here for C9's jungler as far as what he's been playing recently. There's a lot of pushing power with Jax and the Belveth, of course. If you end up getting a lead or if you drop Rift Herald topside, if you win that early Rift Herald fight, there is so much you can gain from that. Pretty tough to win that fight, of course, against Silas in that first battle of ultimate. Silas will be able to match the Orianna ultimate. You have to deal with Equalizer. But I think if C9 can actually win the first Herald, drop it topside, they can get Jax pretty ahead. And then he's going to have an opportunity to be a big side lane threat later on to buy time for Zeri to be that late game carry. The composition here, I feel, for C9 is pretty vanilla, although Zeri's not as common, Beth a little bit rarer. You know what this comp is set out to do. For T1, I think the execution a lot more complex on how they're going to utilize this Bard pick. Yeah, so uh, 423 career games of record for Blabber. This is his second Velvet. So not the most common <laughs> pick for him. <laughs> I'd be curious about the uh, the bard numbers as well, because I know that Carrier has played it before, and it can work in terms of setting up some of the wombo combo that they do have. But uh, yeah, the Belveth coming in, I, I think it definitely does have power. It can be a little bit Feast or Famine, but uh, we have seen a Feast a bit here at Worlds when we have seen it. So I think that C9 trying to bring in some pocket picks, trying to bring in some interesting stuff uh, to potentially take down T1. Got an answer for you on the bard. Seven and one. So that's seven more wins than Blabber has on uh, Velvet. <laughs> and it's of almost 550 games for Carrier's career. That's quite a lot of games. And guys, we're ready to jump into the first game of the day. I think that tells you who the crowd is siding with for this one. Huh, shocker. I, I didn't hear a C9 cheer, Weird. strangely enough. Where, um, where are we? Well, hey. <laughs> They've got <laughs> Korean players on the roster, all right? True, it's, true, true. Sometimes when you have T1 versus Gen G or T1 versus KT, you, you feel like only T1 was there. This is by far the most popular team in Korea. They drown out a lot of fan chants. And uh, we yeah. do have this early aggression here by T1 at level one. Ultimately won't end up being too impactful in a war drop tier either. Yeah, Silas Bard, very strong, level one. So maybe just want to see if they can catch someone out a little bit off guard, but uh, just going to be returning to the lanes. And we'll just have to wait and see what does happen. In this bottom lane matchup especially, I think, you know, we were talking about how Berserker, very key, very um, big carry aspect of the C9 roster, whereas Gumi used to getting a big comfort pick with the first pick, Zaya. Definitely going to have my eyes on that bottom lane. And early on, I'm really curious how well T1's going to be able to push these lanes because the Rumble up top definitely gets pushed. I think Zaya Bard is likely going to be getting pushed early, although I can see that being contested. So it's this mid lane where you would think Orianna can get shove early in the lane just because it's ranged versus melee, but then that's also going to be owner's first look for where he's going to be ganking because the way T1, I feel like, has tried to default their play style is a little bit back to how they were winning about a year ago where they just try and push every lane, play super aggressive. So I think that's what T1 is going to be going for this game. And MNS needs to make sure he has really good wards. And he needs to push as well so that there's not three lanes getting pushed in, which would stop Blabber from having any river access. Yeah, looking to try to use the moments when Faker is clearing to actually get some damage in with his Q as he did there, trying to keep the health slightly to his advantage, to use the range advantage there as best as he can to get one of those wards up. A Blabber will be seen, speaking of wards here, by this one as he does come down towards owner's uh, portion of the jungle. And this early game here, obviously, for Rumble and Jax can go either way. The Rumble has a lot of advantages there. Zayas did take Comet and the Ignite. So he is going to have some ability to put some real pressure on in these first few levels. Yeah, and very early on, I actually think this is advantage T1 because what Blabber did there as much as trying to sneak uh. in behind the turret of Zayus, that's not normally how Rumble lanes go unless I uh, haven't been studying top lane most recently. We have seen a few times that Jax will try to go at level three, level four, like right on the cusp of that and actually proxy that wave so they can avoid the harassment, but he kind of failed it there and will wow. take a bit, bit of damage. Meanwhile... Uh-oh, they just line up for it. That's a lot of poke damage. Got to be careful about that. We've been seeing a lot of summoners burned early in the bottom lane of this world so far. Yeah, so I think good start by Fudge in the top lane. He'll be able to get a recall off there. The problem for Blabber is he's not going to get access to this bottom scuttle crab most likely because the Zaya Bard is already there early. It will depend, though, MNS's condition is very good, uh, so there could be. A, I mean, Blabber being able to get this because of MNS's condition is very strong. This is going to be huge here. We'll be able to pick this one up. 
You see the push in mid also going to be able to help as MNS could come down and assist. Carrier looking for the journey. Uh, nice juke. Yeah, not going to hit that one. Berserker just keeping his cool. Very important to do that, especially with both the supports on the roam. Got to be careful. Yeah, and that magical journey is going to be very useful for setting up flanks for the Silas later on, setting up flanks for Jarvan later on. It does work very well with this composition. The ultimate as well can really put a damper on Jax trying to flank, depending on how Karia wants to utilize it. As, as you mentioned, Fudge will be able to come back to lane with that proxy without burning his teleport. Feels very nice to do. Yeah, and... I, I think MNS, whether or not he's able to hold on to his flash, is going to be so critical this entire game. Nice steal there by Owner, recovering from the earlier crab. But basically, you can see Fudge, Blabbers, Ven, Berserker, they have all ways to escape a Jarvan or Bard ultimate. MNS really doesn't. So if he ever is without flash, they're going to very easily be able to kill him. Owner beginning to bully a bit here in the enemy jungle. He's just going straight at Blabber. He's got the push in the top side. Oh. Blabber uh -oh. is not going to hit that uh -oh. one. He's taking damage from the little Rugs here, and he nearly loses his life, but he is going to flash out of this one as now. Here comes Carry a flash forward, extremely aggressive. And once again, Berserker just going to kind of laugh at him. And they're just putting pressure on in top side and bottom side here in the 2v2 once again. Carrier using the journey to put that pressure on does uh, commit the flash this time around. Doesn't find a ton of success, but they are really just trying to tax C9 everywhere. Knowing Blabber was top side, knowing he was pushed out there, he's forced to flash and fudge. Now level six is up. Uh -oh. oh, he's taken way too much damage from that equalizer already. He's going to go straight into the death chamber. First blood given over to owner in the top lane. I mean, that was just perfectly done. That play was about 45 seconds in the making as well. Well, Jarvan invading Blabber's jungle, pushing him down. Also, Zeus maximizing his experience to hit six at the right time. Very, very hard for C9 to counter that. Big play for T1. Yeah, he's going to be able to pick up his Sork shoes as well off of this play. And yeah, he doesn't have teleport, but the wave is fine. He's going to be able to get back to lane without really any cost here. Fudge at least was able to, you know, proxy that wave and return to lane on that first back without using his, so he can get back to lane right away. But that's a massive amount of gold going into a Rumble's pocket early on. Yeah, it's a pretty good start for T1. <laughs> yeah, it feels pretty good for them. I'm sorry, Jet. So far. <laughs> it's, it's not great. Well, we'll, we'll see how this game develops. Uh, you know, T1 did struggle a bit against TL early, but he's got the shockwave and he's looking to get the flash, and that he will. MNS just going to get out of dodge. That's all Faker needed to do. He didn't have to burn any summoner spells in order to get the flash of MNS. So now when Jarvan hits level six, he can just move in and alt MNS if MNS ever moves past the halfway point. So not only do they get the top kill, they get the mid summer spell flash that they needed, which lets them move to this Drake pretty yeah. uncontested. Well, so I was going to say, I mean, you use that at that timing to grab flash, then, you know, this is before six, but owner can use his flag and drag to threaten that with Faker stealing the shockwave. And now you've grabbed dragon control. And I mean, this is just T1's map to rule right now. All right, Berserker trying to take an aggressive trade here. He's level five against Goomba's level five does have some help from Blabber, who was shadowing them down on the bottom side of the map, but not going to amount to too much. Skuma just walks away from this one as double control ward. It's going to be some free gold over to C9, I suppose. Take yeah. their time killing those. I Just a quick reminder on what's at stake here as well. Both these teams are one and one in the Swiss stage. A win won't advance them, a lose won't eliminate them, but it will put them into either an elimination game or a promotion game. So 2-1 is obviously way better because then that means you'll get two chances to play best of threes where if you win one, you'll advance. Loser goes into the 1-2 pool and will be on the brink of elimination. And there are some top teams down there uh, as well. There will be after today. And Karia here, a little bit overextended, just gonna grab some Spell Thief's edge stacks and they're not gonna commit anything towards him despite his oh flash still being down. His owner's not done yet with this harassment here on the top side. He's got level six. Yeah, this time it's even more powerful. He has the push in the top side again. The ult blown down on the bottom lane. Those men going on in as Karia just trying to walk this one out. But the Zeri ultimate just gonna push T1's bottom lane back as they will not take that fight at this point in time. Yeah, C9 doing their best to try and make something happen. That top side is just getting absolutely steamrolled, though, by T1. Really rough start for Blabber. You really would love to be able to get that first Rift Herald as the Belveth, but he is just behind in experience since that early invade by owners, since the Rumble has been able to push top and is really struggling to get the farm you need to take over the game as Belvin. Yeah, the, the no magic mantle that Fudge has right now, is it going to be doing too much at this stage, obviously with the Sork Shoes already online? Go. And 
You know, if you lose this Herald as C9, you're not going to be able to get Jax accelerated for the mid game. It's just not going to happen. Belveth, as we were talking about in the draft, would love to have that power, get Jax some additional plates. But as it is right now, he just doesn't have any agency here on the top lane. Now, they did stop the Herald take here. They it are did. grouping for this. This is going to be really interesting because Sven left a while ago, leaving Berserker down bot lane for a long time. It's allowed Karia to push the wave, recall, and now be on the way to Rift Herald, which wouldn't give C9 time to kill it. 2v2 at the top side. The Equalizer getting some big value, and now Owner is going to join up with this one as they do want to extend this play, but not sure if they want to overextend as Sven has come on in. And the Black and Drag goes in up to the Recon as Owner just doesn't give a damn. He has Karia behind him, gets him in the death chamber. Oh, as the ultimate man. comes out and everybody is going down on the side of C9 in the top lane. T1 just burning them to a top lane. Well, that'll be four kills for T1 now in this early game, an over 2,500 gold lead. And it was off the play there. Owner's top side, he saves Cataclysm so long there to make sure he can get the most value out of it. Then Karia gets the double ultimate there to lock oh, two Guma. in place. And Guma is going to force the flash, has to use his ult, but that's still going to be a win. You'll always trade your ult for that flash there. Absolutely, but now you're looking at a rumble with five Dark Seal stacks. This, of course, does give the Herald yeah. over as well. What a dream start for T1, playing around Zeus's rumble. For all the games that Faker missed in the summer split, even though they didn't win that many, when they did, it was often off the back of Zeus, and he's been so dominant in that top lane right here. Even though the ultimate was used early, it gets them low enough that gives, and I feel like C9 had a little bit of confidence here. I don't exactly know why. Well, because, I mean, the problem too is that he can flag and drag away from the counter strike here, and Fudge is then forced way too far up, and you've taken so much damage already as Fudge here. You can't stick around in the fight for any extended period of time. It's not like you have any sustained damage yeah. in your members, whereas Zayus has all the sustained damage you could ever want in a skirmish like this. As long as he's at full health and he's untouched, you lose those. Oh boy, here we go again. I feel like Kerry is just kind of playing with his food at this point. Berserker has dealt with this many a time, but now he doesn't have flash, so got to be careful about that. But yeah, Kerry gets up to the top side. I think they thought it was a 3v2 for a while, and maybe they could just isolate owner, but it was just not meant to be. Yeah. And now T1 have really turned the scales in their favor. Over uh, 3,000 gold in the yeah. lead already. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like C9 was stuck between a couple of bad choices. Either they just reset and let the Rift Herald go over, in which case they're already down in gold, they're getting bled out, Belvet falls further behind, or go for a low percentage play, which has bigger drawbacks if it doesn't work. And unfortunately for them, it did not work. The second dragon is spawning, T1 also has control of the river, so C9 is absolutely on the back foot, and T1 is, I feel like, in their comfort zone. This is what they live for, big gold lead, able yeah. to engage any fight they want, and they're doing it. Absolutely. Well, of course, this is still the feature matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz, Gumi Yusi versus Berserker. And there has been a lot of action in the bottom lane. We'll have to wait and see how those 280 carries do scale up and who is going to get the better of this game by the end of it. As the top lane I have talks a, a lot about it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we did see, of yeah. course, that win probability powered by AWS earlier, and uh, I think your guess is as good as theirs at this point in time. It looked very heavily favored even 12 minutes into this game. And that bottom matchup has been, it's its currently deathless for both AD carries, but Carrier put all the pressure on Guma, forced that flash out earlier. He still doesn't yeah. have it, and now he can't really defend this turret without help. And Belbeth is in the main base, so Blabber can't help out, and this is just straight up T1 grabbing plates here, essentially for free. And they may not even need to commit the Herald here, might just want to drop it somewhere else. And that yeah. looks like that's what they're going to do. I think pretty easy to drop at mid lane as well, get a little bit of extra gold on a Faker. He's the only person on the team who isn't currently ahead. That's also the one lane that wasn't naturally winning early. So wouldn't shock me if they just use this bot pressure, push people back in the river and look for a fight or drop the Herald mid. While well, they're over the wall, they're looking for Sven as he is going to get dunked on. And he's got one hope, his ultimate ability, but that's not going to do enough as he was alone. 1v4 as T1 come over the wall, you know, not playing against a lot of bards, I would imagine, but that ability to just attack you in your own jungle, very difficult to deal with. Yeah, I mean, you already don't have a lot of vision. You're already having to pre-plan around a lot, and then that happens. Isaiah's actually getting a little bit caught here. 
Say it's just gonna walk it out. I mean, he's still up a level as the ultimate committed to there by Fudge. And you talked about the Rift Herald. It is going to be dropped in mid lane. Yep. And this might just be a full turret. I mean, C9 not really in a position to defend this as finally some people are coming over. Owner is just going for a little, <laughs> little walk behind the turret just for fun. I mean, I don't even know what he's doing. He doesn't seem to care. Uh, showboating, maybe. Yeah. I can't really think of any sure. other reason to do that than to have a little bit of fun because they know they're up 4,000 gold. I feel like they're really in their comfort zone right now. Uh, he had the portal there, wasn't able to take it to get back over the wall, but took the long way around. Perhaps afraid Blabber was coming down faster than he expected, but ultimately it doesn't matter. But this is what you were talking about in terms of the engage range here. Look at this, getting Faker into position to help lock Sven down. Yeah, he gets away from the Everfrost, tries to hold out, but the Cataclysm is going to keep him in place, yeah. so he's just simply dead. No way out of that one. And that's what you're dealing with with Bard, is just putting these melee engaged champions into range of slippery champions like Zeri, of slippery champions like Rakan. They feel fairly safe even without vision when you know generally where people are, but they can go through walls. Looks well, about right. MasterCard lane economy snapshot. It is, uh, well, Faker's only up 31 gold. The rest of the map, very heavily favored on the top side, plus the plates you would imagine down on the bottom side that give uh, Guma and Karia their lead down there. Yeah, I, I think even even at this state in the game, there's an extremely low chance that C9 loses. And the currently, the disappointing thing about this game for C9 is all the plays that C9 may have been dodging in the early game, like Karia flying over the wall and throwing cues at Berserker and Berserker juking them. There was never like a counter play that C9 would be able to make. Uh oh, Fudge in a lot of, of trouble. He flashes onto the other side of the equalizer. Zeus just tanking this one up. Fudge is still alive underneath this turn. He's just going to get flagged from the heavens as owner. Going to pick up his fourth kill in this game. And here's another example. They spent so long on that dive top. So there's three people for C9 bottom trying to make the counter happen. Let's see if C9 can at least get a turret. I mean, they're going to try to here. Karia does have ult. This is going to be very difficult to pull off. And Faker, of course, can hijack something as well. Can grab the shockwave here and try to defend with it. I don't think they're going to be able to get much. Meanwhile, Berserker can't defend this turret by himself. This is a cannon wave. So get the top side play to be a success. Unfortunately, Fudge's flash not good enough to get away from that cataclysm and the equalizer. He's impaled by the flag. They lose top turret. Mid turret's down. They find nothing bottom side. 15 minutes and 45 seconds in. Those bounties are up, objective bounties are up, but there is just nothing to take on this rift. And I mean, we are on pace. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but we are on pace for a perfect game here potentially for T1. Yeah, I mean, Wolf, you've been here for the summer split struggles of T1. I, I have, yes. Right? The, the MSI disappointment, Faker's wrist injury, falling to what was it, seven and seven. Yeah. And then Faker coming back and kind of scraping the team through playoffs. Where would you put how they look in this game? compared I mean, to how they looked in the summer split. They look very coordinated, and the thing that, that happened when Faker was gone was not that Poby, his replacement, was so weak comparatively they couldn't play the game. It was really just about the lack of shot calling, and they had a clear game plan to play around Zayas this game, put the pressure on bottom side at the same time. And Faker, if he had fallen further behind in lane, if MNS had actually been able to find some success there, maybe there would have been a pressure point for Blabber, but it feels like Owner yeah. is just one step ahead of Blabber this entire time. Yeah. I think Faker coming in as a leader, that's always been his role in recent years, right? We've all know the yep. Faker moments. We've all seen the LeBlanc plays. We've all seen the Zed versus Zed. But in recent years, he has kind of been that big voice. And yeah. you could clearly feel the preparation going into this series is much stronger than we saw at the latter part of summer season without him. Yeah, I feel like the going through world's history, you know, things Faker does. 2013, always these amazing mechanical outplays. Things Faker does has changed a lot in the last 11 years. Now the thing Faker does is get a bunch of really mechanically talented players around him, hold his own in mid lane, and press his F keys really good and talk. He's been pressing his keys pretty well. Owner, once again, I, maybe it's showboating, I'm not sure. Owner in a little bit of trouble as he does have some help from his squad, but he is going to be able to get away. Blabber gets hooked by the feathers, and now there's a massive equalizer on the entirety of C1, just trying to, C9 rather, trying to retreat out of this one. That's a huge play comes out from Karia, oh. and they turn this one around, and even the tower can't get into this one, as Karia will disable that. This might just be a clean ace going into the hands of T1, and that it is. Nobody will fall on the 
side of T1. An insane win here for T1, but we all saw it coming. They had control over the Dragon, and at this point in time, Owner is just so tanky, he could absorb a lot of that damage, and as the turn begins, it feels almost tool-assisted the way that T1 chased the fight. <laughs> and the, the way the Equalizer is, is set up by Zayas, watch this play again, as Owner takes all of the aggression here as they kite back through, missed Extendo Beam here from Berserker. Look at the Equalizer positioning as it goes through this brush. It is just so clean, and no one on C9 can avoid this Equalizer damage yeah. except Sven. He's only going to get over the wall. You can't flash out. You're on a fat wall, and now you're trapped between this, this wall here and Karius Re-Engage. Oh. He goes through with the Magical Journey, sets up the stun, disables the turret so they can further deep dive here, and you are just not going to get out. If you were Cloud9, you were just trapped between a rock and a hard place. One oh of our famous boy. LCK lines. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's only 9,000 gold at 18 minutes. This is definitely... For now. This is one of the most lopsided games we have seen all Swiss stage. And we've we've seen some big ones, too. Yeah, we have. We've had a That's couple a of 24-minute uh, games as well. And, uh, you know, Wolf was talking about it before. We're on pace for a perfect game. That's just going to be Berserker dead for free. There's just no help under the turret. He has Flash, but no time to react. And T1 are just taking whatever they want on this map right now. Yeah, certainly looking very much like this game is not going much longer. I mean, we're talking about it's Chemtech Soul. That's a, that's one thing you put in the positives column. It's not like they're getting Hextech Soul on this next dragon here. But the map is completely open. This Herald is going to take out the inner. Will likely get a charge here on that inhibitor turret if they want to commit to it. They don't even have to. And T1 have control over every zone on the map. Look at the wards they have to the top side of the jungle as well towards a Baron that will be spawning in 10 seconds. So you've yep. got to clear all of that as C9 before you can even think about the contest. It's quite clinical what T1 has been able to do this game. Good timing on the first three Drakes. Really good timing on this last reset as well so that they can move towards Baron on spawn. That's a T1 classic. I mean, they do flip a lot of Barons. They, they actually move towards Baron on spawn, even if they're not up 11,000 gold. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but this time, they are. And Faker, I mean, he's on three, four, five people Just down to the, the bottom side of the map. And yes, they will get this objective Woo! bounty. Not a perfect game, chat. <laughs> not a perfect game, but it's a perfect Baron. Nobody is going to contest them on that one. As we saw the win probability once again powered by AWS, it looked like 100% actually this time. There wasn't even like a little blip. Yeah, that's time. about right. This would be a higher win probability than G2's comeback on day two when they were at a 99.4% chance of losing. Yeah, I think we might this be would, adding 50, be higher. 50 gold for the Nexus on this uh, Red Bull power, <laughs> Red Bull um, <laughs> Baron power play if they, they wanted to push it further. But just to be safe, they will of course sync up the waves. They're gonna put Faker in the bottom lane here. And Blabber. Hey, he got the blue buff. Yeah. You well, know what? At what cost? That's pretty, that's pretty good. He got the buff. Oh, no. He's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he's, he's being chased down here by owner. I think that carry is just going to let him do the 1v1 thing. And there he goes. Dunks into the ground. I say this a lot, but it's hard to criticize teams that are in positions like this, 13,000 gold behind. I mean, you could say there's no way he has any right to that blue buff, but if you just sit in your base, what are you doing at this point? I mean, T1 have won this game, and yep. everything that happens from now on, and frankly, everything that happened from five minutes ago on, is really hard to criticize for, for C9. There really is no correct play. Uh, now Faker is just doing a dance in the enemy base at this point in time. Picks up the quickness and uh, just kind of shoves it in their face as T1. You know, they're on pace to try to break one of the fastest games that we have had here in the Swiss stage. The turrets of the Nexus are already going down. C9, they're going to have to make one last stand. And they get the knock up here on Azeus who loses a total of zero health at this point in time as the Bard ultimate comes out as well. And Carry is having a lot of fun at this point. Fudge is in that back line, but he's just going to be ripped to shreds by the Feathers once again. As C1 will play with their food, they will get what they deserve after this victory. As down will go the Nexus, T1 will move on to 2-1 and one in the Swiss stage. Really dominant showing by T1. This is the team that T1 fans wanted to have show up at the World Championship and moves into two and one. Unfortunately, both those wins were against North American seeds, but that's what happens at the World Championship. You have to be able to beat LCK and LPL teams if you want to be moving on. So C9, gonna have to just take that one on the chin and come back stronger next time.
Yeah, I think the difference in owner's play in this game and some of the other games we've seen in the world, you could definitely feel it. I think owner's been one of the most heavily criticized T1 players in Worlds thus far, despite, you know, only being one and